Good evening. This is such a joy for me. You're such a gift. I thought I'd start with a little story. Uh, recently, I was on a plane, and we were all getting ready to disembark. And it's, it's just evident that we all kind of have a low tolerance for waiting even one extra second on the stuffy plane. And so, you know, people just want out of there. So everyone's standing in the aisles. They're bringing down their luggage. They're collecting their things. They're checking their iPhones, avoiding eye contact at all costs. And suddenly, a woman's shrill, frantic voice came from the front. We need to go potty! I have never seen anything like it. Every person on the plane, regardless of age, race, class, or creed, literally dove back into their former seats to clear the way for the voice. A woman with a two-year-old son beneath her arm like a football, dangling precariously, making a mad dash for the back of the plane. It was like the parting of the Red Sea. She was swift, and it would seem successful. It was a glorious moment for humanity. I mean, no explanation, no apology needed. We all wanted her to make it. What was so moving to me, though, was the self-sacrifice of those who would now be running themselves to another terminal, or those who also had to go potty, but just not as badly. <laughs> Seeing this witness of mad parental love opened my eyes, and I realized I never thanked my parents for potty training me. <laughs> it never even crossed my mind to do it. I mean, look at what this entails, okay? Listening to and putting another's needs first before mine, regardless of convenience. Perseverance, dedication, overcoming humiliations, rejoicing at the slightest of victories. <laughs> I never intended to be ungrateful. It's just some things go unappreciated or just are plain taken for granted. We have received so much to be thankful for. So many blessings are coming at us at every second of every day. And the source of each and every one of these blessings is the relationship the Father gives me with himself. Right now, he's saying to you, I love you. I choose you. I trust you. Let's pray. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come through Mary whose yes brought us every blessing in the heavens in Jesus. Open our hearts, help us to receive the Father's love anew, more deeply than we've ever received it before. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So first, the Father loves you. I want to tell you a story about Matt and Lucy, friends of ours. Matt was healthy, outgoing, athletic, engaged to Lucy. They were a shining couple, fun-loving, chaste. Everybody always wanted to be around them. Before their wedding, Matt was diagnosed with cancer and given a year to live. Putting their trust in God's will for them, they still got married, but they canceled their honeymoon so that Matt could begin his treatments. Towards the end of those treatments, they conceived their first child, and doctors pressured them to terminate the pregnancy not knowing how the chemo had affected Matt and expecting fetal anomalies. Matt and Lucy refused. They began to pray. They put the life of their unborn child into the Lord's hands. Their friends and family prayed, awaiting the day of the birth. The baby arrived, and after inspecting him, the doctor saw that he did indeed have one birth defect. The two fingers in the middle of his hand were just slightly fused to his palm, like this. I don't know if anyone speaks sign language, but this is, I love you. I love you. It, it was remedied with a simple surgery, but Matt and Lucy received it as a message from their father, brought to them through a son, the gospel in miniature. I love you. But what if their baby had been severely disabled, totally helpless, even frightfully dependent? What would the Father be saying then? In the face of suffering, we're tempted to ask like the apostles did with the man born blind, 
hey, Jesus, who sinned? This guy or his parents? Like it's punishment. Little do we realize the father's actually saying, I love you even more. I will bestow more grace upon you. I will give you a love that's closer to mine. Some blessings come to us in disguise. I was out in Wisconsin and I met a teenage boy named Nick who was confined to a wheelchair. He was totally nonverbal except for groans. And yet his family had this whole intricate system of communication depending on where Nick put his eyes and how he flicked his wrists. Beautiful. His siblings were model gorgeous and the stars on their teams. But this brother of theirs was their pride and joy. And by Nick's smile, you recognized he knew this. The youth minister at the parish felt inspired to ask if Nick would be willing to be Jesus in the live stations of the cross. Nick was excited at the opportunity. That Good Friday, there was a hush over the parish as his father carried him from station to station. The crucifixion left you speechless. Nick hung there on the cross, and his father was hidden from sight, but he was actually standing behind him with his arms wrapped around him, holding his son. Sometimes we don't see the father. This is the reality, though. Doesn't matter how incapable, twisted, unworthy, or far away you may feel. You are his beloved, and he holds you. When we bless ourselves, we make the sign of the cross. It's the sign of our salvation. We do it all the time, but do we see the crosses in our life as a blessing? Realizing that there's a certain intimacy with Jesus that's only possible when I'm united to him on the crosses of my life, letting him die and rise in me, bringing me to the Father in a new way. Now, the catechism is clear. No one is Father as God is Father. Whatever your relationship with your earthly father is or was, it's never enough. We have an infinite need for the everlasting Father. He's the only one who can fill us, who speaks into my life the blessing that I'm noticed, I am good, I was always wanted. I'm a cause of joy and I'm a source of delight. And because we're made in His image, nothing finite is ever going to be enough. Examples. Great meal with a friend. Ugh, oh, it's over. Gorgeous sunset. Gone. More. I want more. I don't know. I had this experience with like YouTube clips. Someone was um, showing me this video of a newborn baby like clinging to the face of its mother, and it was like, oh, precious. What else is what else is going on? And it was like cutest dog clips meeting babies for the first time. It was like, oh. Why? So sweet. And then click, oh, what's this next? And then it was like <laughs> montage of the ugliest dog breeds in the world. And it was like, oh, <laughs> click. <laughs> Up next, most gruesome animal attacks caught on film. I'm like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> what's going, stop the madness. I was just taken where I never intended to go. <laughs> but doesn't this happen in other areas of our lives? It does. Whenever we try and fill infinite needs with finite things, we become slaves. I want you to just take a second and think, are there areas in your life where you've allowed yourself to be taken, where you never intended to go. And now you're powerless, like a slave. I want you to name it in your heart. Because tonight, Jesus breaks those chains. 
St. Paul said to us, you were not given a spirit of slavery leading you back into fear. You were given a spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. The Father loves you and the Father chooses you. In baptism, we became adopted sons and daughters of the Father, and this term can be confusing. But if you understand what adoption meant to the ancient Romans, it sheds light in a deeper reality of what Paul was speaking to. In Roman law, if a child was natural born, the father of the family had the right to reject or abandon that child for any reason. However, in the case of adoption, this was not permissible. If a child was adopted into a family, that child not only received all the same privileges, benefits, and inheritance as a natural born child, but the choice of the father was definitive and binding and he could never abandon, reject, or disown that child. The adopted child had greater security in the father. A couple who'd been living near Benin, Africa, moved to France. They'd been unable to conceive, and the wife had a very vivid dream one night. She dreamt she had two sons. One was six, and the other was nine. She held them, played with them, laughed, and when she woke, She told her husband, describing them, their hair, their eyes, even the shape of their noses. It was mysterious, but she was convicted. They were real. Her husband was leaving for a business trip back to Benin, and she asked him to stop by the Missionaries of Charity orphanage there and share the dream with the sisters. He did, and as he entered, two rambunctious little boys rounded a corner, and upon seeing him, ran up to him with their arms wide open. And he he put his hand on their heads and he knelt to receive them, laughing and then crying. They were six and nine and matched his wife's description perfectly to the nose. A sister comes in and kind of startled by the strange scene she's witnessing, whispers a gentle warning, sir, These children have AIDS. And he looks up at her and he says, these are my children. Their sickness had nothing to do with who they were to the Father. And doesn't our Father say this to us when we're sick and dying on account of sin? You are mine. This is like no other relationship. It's not employee, boss, slave, master, perfect strangers. I think sometimes we can treat God a little bit like the speed trap cop, you know, like, gotcha. No. Or Santa, you know, like, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. No. Yikes. No. Our Father's love goes to the extremes. Indwelling. Jesus said, whoever loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. He dwells within you. You are never alone. No struggle, no suffering, no difficulty or disappointment can separate us from the father. One thing can rupture this relationship. Mortal sin is the only thing that separates us from the blessing but we can actually dupe ourselves into thinking, ah, God doesn't mind, he'll bless me anyway. He cannot bless us when we step outside of the safety of his house to do whatever we want in distant lands. When we sever ourselves like this, he holds on to our blessing and awaits our return. Blessed Charles de Foucauld is a modern day prodigal He squandered his grandfather's inheritance in gluttony, lust, and gambling. And after a dishonorable discharge from the military, came home to his family. His cousin Marie welcomed him back. And her radiant faith was like a light in Charles' darkness. He would sit in the back of church and pray what he later called the strange prayer. God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. When he finally made his confession after years and years entrenched in sin, he he said of it, I became a child again. Come, blessed of my father, receive the kingdom prepared for you. The father loves you, chooses you, 
and says, I trust you. I trust you. This makes me think of the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, I used to watch it year-round so much so that friends stopped telling me when they were down in the dumps or felt like life had no meaning because they knew my remedy included George Bailey and a guardian angel named Clarence. (laughs) No spoiler alert here, but George is given a chance to see what life would be like had he never been born. There's this poignant scene in a graveyard where George comes to the headstone of a beloved younger brother, Harry, whom he saved from drowning as a child. But since George had never been born, Harry, who was going to be a World War II hero, never saw his 10th birthday. Clarence says, strange, isn't it, George? Each man's life touches so many other lives. And when he isn't there, it leaves an awful hole. You matter. The way that you live matters. The choices you make matter. We recently honored a man named Dr. Michael Brescia, director of Calvary Hospital in the Bronx. He shared a moment that really put him on the map. In 1966, through an apparent fluke, he discovered the fistula, which makes ongoing dialysis possible. It wasn't possible at the time, and the first company that heard about it offered him $1 billion to keep it secret for one year while they worked on the patent. He was married with several young children, and the thought of financial prosperity excited him. That night, he went home to tell his father, who was an Italian immigrant who'd been pulled from school at the age of six to shovel coal, worked hard his entire life. The original conversation was in Italian. I give it to you in English. My son, I'm so proud of you. How many people in the world will be saved because of your invention? Well, Papa, 50,000 die in America alone every year. Well, hurry up then. Don't waste a day. When he told his father about the delay, the money offered to him, his father's response dismayed him. No, no, no. Give it away. If you don't, when you shave in the morning, Your face will disappear. And the faces of the children who lost parents this year, they will appear one after the other. When you go out to eat, you'll have to leave an empty chair for the people who died this year because of your silence. Don't think of this world. For boats, cars, houses, you would let 50,000 people die? No. Give it away. The Italian is lasciare, which means release it like a bird out of its cage. Dr. Brescia published it the next day, and it was picked up worldwide. The invention is now worth over $60 billion, and he never saw a penny of it. Tell you, he's the richest man I know. Rich in what matters to God. Lasciare. We, too, have to let go of so many things that keep us from the blessing that is ours, the pleasure-seeking, the comfort-seeking, trying to find our identity, our security, and things that just pass away. I have to release my fear, the need to control. I have to live my mission because he trusts me. I'm in relationship with a father who has a plan for my life. Tonight, we claim again the Father's blessing. The Father loves you. He chooses you. He trusts you. At this time, the altar is going to be prepared for adoration, waiting to receive Jesus. And we're going to prepare our own hearts and open them up to all of the gifts to receive the blessing anew. Every Mother's Day, we invite the women that we've served to our retreat center. Their kids are so used to being cooped up in inner city apartments, (laughs) you should see them run and play out in our front yard. It's huge. They love it. I was standing by a seminarian, and a five-year-old boy darted over to us and pulled on his sleeve 
and said, hey, can you pick me up and put me on your shoulders like that boy over there? And we looked to where he was pointing, and there was another seminarian with a boy his age perched on his shoulders, holding him you know, by the ankles for security like a dad. And that seminarian knelt down, and this little boy kind of mounted him like a horse, and they, they went up, and it, he was like, ooh, and then they went to meet the other pair. And it was like, oh. Then the boys met, and there was some kind of a weird chicken fight that ensued, and then <laughs> sisters intervened for safety. <laughs> but I was very moved, struck by this little boy. See that over there? I've never experienced it, but I just know it's meant for me. His humility to simply ask for what we all need and ache after, to be carried, to feel secure and protected, to be fathered, really. Ask and you shall receive. We don't always believe this. St. Ignatius, who wrote The Discernment of Spirits, he tells us that the voice of desolation tries to claim our past present and future, saying, it's always been this way. It is this way. It will always be this way. So often we hand desolating thoughts and lies a microphone and we set them on the stage of our hearts. It's like, wow, that's the worst thing I've ever heard about myself. Say it again, just this time in surround sound, yeah. No, no, Jesus' authority is mine. I can stand in it, speak in it. I am the beloved of the Father. Renounce these lies. Reject discouragement. Let these thoughts be taken captive. Because you know what? The Lord never accuses or discourages us. He's infinitely good. And every decision he makes in our regard is good. In fact, when we go to confession, the Father runs to meet us. We are the prodigal saying, bless me, Father, for I have sinned against heaven and against you. I don't deserve to be your son or your daughter. And then what happens? Those chains that you thought of earlier, they fall with these words. God, the Father of mercies, sent the Holy Spirit into the world for the forgiveness of sins and I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Ask and you shall receive. Several years ago, one of my sisters was a nurse volunteering at an orphanage in Romania. It was totally understaffed. She was telling me what an eerie experience it was because the babies don't cry because they know that no one will respond to it. Ugh, this is a symptom of the orphan spirit. The same thing happens today in this culture, in this very room. There are places in our hearts that have not yet cried out to the Father because of a lack of faith. We don't believe that a good Father will hear and come and pick us up. We have a good Father and he hears you, he loves you, he's chosen you, he trusts you. Tonight, we break the silence. Ask and you shall receive. Close your eyes for a second, I just want you to take a moment to receive this stunning truth. God is my Father. I want you to say it with me, ready? God is my Father. <laughs> Let's direct it to him. God, you are my Father. God, you are my Father. God, you are my Father. Give voice to it. Cry out tonight. Come, you blessed of my Father. Receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world.